tubers. Well, I want to discuss the MITT fusion reactor a little bit longer, and I've drawn some more diagrams to kind of illustrate what's going on here, and I've come to a few conclusions as well. Even though originally I was stating that the agitator itself would have to go back and forth, turns out you could just spin the thing. Now, of course, you can have some commutator problems with uh, these if they happen to be electromagnets as well, but commutators can be overcome. I mean, honestly, uh, this is not something that's beyond the realm of physics, but I really want to discuss how we're getting the higher yields or how we're getting the higher compression. Now, in a standard tokamak fusion reactor, you end up with the, uh, the standard donut. And then uh, the whole thing crushes it down, and you end up with the donut ring of compressed fusion. And I've gotten a little bit of, not negative feedback, but obviously either someone is like, someone's a little bit confused as to what I'm doing. And I guess the best way to put this is I'm trying to create something better than that. And unfortunately, even though we have a systematic crushing down to a thread-like object here, and then of course you get the spin and whatnot, that's, that's a really good design. However, that would be the round aperture, and if anybody's been following, I don't know, inlet dynamics on hypersonic, hypersonic fighters or hypersonic uh, systems, you'll find that the triangular inlet, or in this case the triangulated uh, pressure wave as opposed to a oval or round pressure wave, gives you about 3% just automatically. So right off the bat, we get 3% better compression. And that's not with just this narrowing, that's just the triangulation uh, configuration. You end up with 3% overall uh, efficiency increase over an oval or a round compression system. Now the triangular also you, you've got this this deep chasm. Now if any of you have studied deep ocean dynamics to chasms when you're dealing with extreme pressure systems and I'm kind of borrowing a little bit from deep sea studies on this one and I'm also comparing that to what I've seen in plasma systems concerning uh, G-class stars. And in G-class stars I find that they have a, uh, if you look at the remnants of, of, well, if you look at the remnants of supernovas long enough, you'll start to see some similarities. And that's why I put that in my book. You know, some of my stuff in my book is very, very uh, advanced in, in what I've been able to uh, ascertain from the remnants of stars. One of those things I noticed uh, was the, uh, the leftover core leftover core and happens to be shaped uh, well, a little bit more like a top than it does anything else. And the main thing is is the squeeze. The squeeze is this type of squeeze here down to a, a, an infinite point or a near infinite point. And when I was looking at the different pressure gradients, uh, just like in a deep sea dynamics thing, the pressure gradients, it goes up really, really high. Uh, we could be looking at, you know, we talk about fusion needing, say, 200 degrees, 200 million degrees Celsius. If I get 3% over that, well, that, that's more. Plus, if I have this deep uh, chasm gradient that's occurring as well, as opposed to just the round. Now, with the round, of course, you've got, uh, equal pressure from all sides coming down and, and you're getting that crunch down to the, down to the thread like that. Well, that's, that's nice, but you're only going to get one punch. What this system can do that other fusion reactors don't seem to be able to do is create a prime and fire system. So the agitator can essentially reload the pockets while maintaining the higher pressure. And that's going to be really important. Now, like I said in the beginning of this video, this agitator could very well just be spun. And you could spin it at a certain rate, and it would cause this uh, this channel here to pack and reload, pack and reload, pack and reload, and you you keep pushing it until the the deep deepest part of the highest pressure chasm here, uh, say like four and five. You you'd actually float that thing, 
and you'd be able to speed up this agitator core to be able to push it into the higher uh, five and sixes, which would, which would push it down furthest, and you'd end up with your, your bursts. So as the agitator would be spun up, this pocket would get higher and higher and higher pressures and temperatures, and then, of course, there would be bursts of uh, a fusion that would occur from the deepest part of this chasm, which is down here at six. And that would the reason why we'd want to do that is just like with a with a test shot from a standard tokamak fusion reactor, you have to build up the temperature, you have to build up the pressure, and then you hit it. Um, similar to the NIF facility, National Ignition Facility, when they're using the lasers for the uh, the target there, and they're they're bringing it down from all sides. Uh, that's occurring on a tokamak as well, but they're doing it with a, essentially a, a belt. This one would be doing it in, in tiny wedge-shaped chasms, and of course the wedge-shaped chasms would uh, be releasing, or would be would be pushed and packed and pushed and packed and pushed and packed and pushed and packed until you reached almost the point of fusion, and you could hold it there. This thing could beat it there, and it'd be almost like, like little fusion heartbeats, just boom, 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 because you would have enough material that would be stacked up behind it in layers that would be able to uh, reload that pocket. And I think that's what's going to be important. The tokamak fusion reactor, of course, you can prime it, you can fire it, prime it and fire it, prime it and fire it, uh, but the length of time between primer and, and firing it is is a lot. There's a whole bunch of time there, and, and maintaining a continuous fusion, of course, is, has been an issue. This design here would auto prime and auto reload the fusion firing spots without destroying the magnets, and that's important as well. Uh, another thing I, I was thinking about was okay, so if we have a we have a nice nice. Uh, Compress compressor curve here, which you can see I've lengthened it out. In this drawing, it's, it's a bit more extreme. It might be more like this, but I'm, I was just thinking if it was more like this, it could be smoother, and then you could just spin the core one direction as opposed to agitating it, and then uh, it would continually repack that material into the, uh, the maximum pressure ditch. And just like in the tokamak, the standard tokamak fusion reactor, you're going to have this maximum pressure you're going to reach, and you're going to need to be able to get to you know 110, 210 million, 200, no, 210,000, 200, no, it's 210,000, I think, 210,000, uh, there's 200, no, 210 million, it's 210 million, Ooh. 210 million degrees C, because uh, standard is, it's like you're, you're your threshold is like 105, 107 million for, for little pops, but they're, they're wanting to sustain it, so you have to get even hotter. I'm estimating a, a maximum pressure inside these ditches. Like I said, it curves towards infinity, but you're gonna, there's going to be a maximum amount, of course, that you're not going to reach infinity, of course. And you could be looking at maybe a billion. And that's not quite a million more, but it's quite a bit more. That's, you know, that's... You get three three percent plus plus your ditch, uh, a sparking ditch or the the <laughs> the trench. This thing this thing's definitely going to increase your your pressure, and then of course because you're oscillating it and you're compressing it, you should get your your bursts. Uh, you know you're going to have so many rotations, maybe even per second, that you're going to have to reach before this thing fires. I think. Just like I said before, you could just agitate. You could just move this slightly into place and cause, because of the flow uh, of the injected uh, pre-fusion particles. When you, when you look at standard tokamaks, though, they they bring it up, they heat it up, and then they stomp it, boom, and you get you know a few milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds of uh, active fusion going on there. This one is going to have similar effects, but it's going to auto reload. This the stream coming in is, is going to get compressed by the uh, not agitator, but really the reloader as it's spun uh, to reload these pockets. You know, I I don't know how to explain it. What's in my head? I, I can see it in my mind. I can see it working. 
the the numbers are there. The the wave dynamics. It's all about wave dynamics. You know, we, we've got. You know, I, I wrote up just a, a brief little thing. We got velocity of the stream uh, times your heat. You know, that's your pressure and your compression. Compressor one, compressor one, C one. C one is going to be your your outer your outer ring. Uh, C two, you got your inner agitator or reloader. C two, and then you got C three, which is the back pressure of the material, and that's that's down here in the in the sparking ditch, and that's uh, I got two views of it here. This is a side view and then a front and cutaway view. Uh, this isn't just going to flow away because of how fast this one is going to push it in. I mean, you're going to have back pressure, especially when you have a fusion event, and that's what we're talking about is a fusion event. So when you have a fusion event, this is going to push back on the incoming stream, giving you compression. Three, uh, of course, that's going to be uh, your secondary velocity. Uh, you get your fusion one, heat two, heat two. That's that creates H two too. So it's C C three uh, H two, and then of course you get fusion one, which is F one. Uh, fusion one technically is here. after fusion so I guess that's it's gonna be F1 and then of course F1 feed this this material here feeds towards F2 and it kind of preheats this material further and that was a what I was trying to say before is is the inner agitator you're gonna have to have increased recesses to allow for the expansion of the fusion material uh, between shots when it expands. You have to have some place to go, otherwise it's going to destroy the magnets. So you're, you're going you're to compress it, it's going to blast, you have to give it some place to go, and then of course it's preheating for the next shot as well. Uh, although the next shot, if, if this is done correctly and you feed it in correctly with the injector, um, you should be able to get your, your, your a repetitive shot where your agitator you know, like, like I said, in the original design, I'm like, well, you can use an agitator and go back and forth and, and reload it like that. You could still possibly do that, but I'm thinking, well, why don't we just spin it and get a continuous ripple wave compression that this, this, uh, you know, as each, as each uh, <clears throat> peak goes by, it's going to compress a little bit more, compress a little bit more, compress a little bit more, that in conjunction with your magnetic field. Now, I didn't mention uh, the, the crushing force. This is your pinch. These two outer rings here, those are your pinch, to pinch down in here. Now these are just surface magnets to keep it from, from escaping. But those are those are where your pinch is going to come from, these, these ones out here. And then of course you got your, must have some inner ones on this one. So it would be difficult to create this spun agitator or spun reloader in the middle, but it would be beneficial in the fact that you could get a proper reload and refire out of your fusion pockets themselves, which I think is going to be super important. But um, if any of you have studied, you know, deep sea dynamics or, you know, just, yeah, just deep sea dynamics, so you're, you're going to see the same thing in this type of configuration. Uh, the other thing you've got going for is centrifugal. You know, this is going to be spun out, so you get spun out, and it's also being crushed down by the magnetic field. And, and all the other stuff on top of this, this pushes on this, pushes on this, pushes on this, pushes on this. And of course, you got these things that can push back. That's these two waves here, and you're going to end up with some some pretty some pretty gnarly compression down in these uh, down in these pockets, and it will exceed this uh, symmetrical crushing here. You'll go way way beyond it. And that's that's what I was saying. You got you got one one hyperbola up here, up the ramp, and then you got another hyperbola as it as it crushes it down into these. Uh, into these pockets into the sparking ditch. So that and that. Uh, there's there's so much pressure there. And like I said, the temperature, you know, you, you could you could easily go way, way beyond your standard. Standard token Mac, yeah, yeah, you got equal pressure from all sides and you're crushing it down into a ribbon. This one, you've still got equal pressure from all sides. However, down inside this 
sparking ditch, the pressures go way, way higher. The temperatures are going to go way, way higher. And it's just going to be for a moment. As this thing passes, it's going to collapse or squish that that down in there because this is going to push back. You can you can also uh, use your you can also use these magnets to push back, create resistance of this flow. So it's it's going to be a little bit of dance, but you should be able to get your uh, reloadable fusion pockets, which is something that these currently can't do. I mean, well, it takes a lot of time. I mean, with the current designs, uh, the the spherical tokamak, same same kind of deal. They're going to with uh, equal pressure from all sides, or, or they're going to have two rings and and they're going to crush it down like that. And they'll probably have a little entry point here and an exit point here, like a chimney. Um, or maybe they'll just keep it in there and just go. But getting the getting the fuel back into the center of the reaction, it, I think that's going to be the main problem. That you're going to have in either one of these designs, and I think from what I've seen, we can recharge that pocket with this agitator. So essentially, you you'll use the agitator to open it and then close it, open it and then close it. So it's going to open it and reload it uh, with each shot. And if you spun it, I think you could get a successive wave that would crush down and. Uh, and cause repetitive firing from that deep chasm. And like I said, triangulated compression, you're gonna get automatically, boom, 3% higher. So we're, we're already 3% over just for, from our shape uh, over the tokamak, the standard tokamak design, the Taurus. And you're just gonna have a lot more compression down in this area here, way more compression. Um, especially if it's spun. It, I mean, this all comes down to not waiting for gravity to give you an assist, but giving it that assist. Uh, does the outer shell need to be spun as well? Hmm. I don't think so, but maybe. Maybe you'll have to spin this outer shell as well to, because the plasma, of course, would, would automatically settle down into the ditch where you'd want it. I think maybe, 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 maybe you have to spin a little bit. Uh, but the inner one, the inner one can, I think it can just stay an agitator. But if you did spin it way up, let's say you did 3,000 RPM, well, you're gonna hit, you're gonna hit that pocket 3,000 times in a minute. So it's gonna go da 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 And that's, it's kind of like uh, a big hammer is pounding all this stuff down into this chasm and your temperature is going to go up your compression is going to go up and it's going to create a feed that can feed that pocket and it's going to create an area if you're if you match the fusion output to the pockets going by you can match it up pretty good you might screw up a few agitators when you're tuning this out because you know the first couple times you do it you're going to probably blow these magnets up and uh, until you get the timing right, you could probably do it with simulators. I don't have big giant computers other than the one on my shoulders uh, that can simulate this kind of stuff. But when I was looking at it earlier, the back pressure at C3 from the ongoing fusion uh, reaction versus the incoming uh, pressure waves of pre-fusion material. I, I think from what I've seen, it's going to align them better. So you're gonna get like this this tiny string, instead of a big, 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 long ribbon that's just gonna burn all this material out, you're gonna get a tiny string down in that ditch that's going to fuse. You're not gonna, it's not gonna fuse all the material in the entire ring. It's gonna just fuse the stuff at the highest pressure in the ditch. And then of course it's got an escape area that it can blast out, you know, so that's, that's really good. So uh, that's I wanted to add this to the other videos. I, I realize that this is uh, is an ongoing project. I'm I'm still drawing. I'm still figuring it out. I'm still thinking about this. I've also added a another linear accelerator to spin the core up. You're going to need a lot of torque to move that up and to maintain its spin. There's going to be a magnetic bearing on top and bottom. Uh, you're going to probably have to use some type of commutator. You may have to use like a uh, like a gas slip vapor to be able to just the hole inside might be uh, like a like a metal foam, so you have structural integrity of the unit. At the same time, you you could move like an ultra cold gas through there and, and cool everything off. 
uh, like an open cell foam, you know, heavy heavy gauge open cell foam for the inside, so it'd be lightweight, it'd be balanced, and you know, you can use variable density foam too, like you know, from from the inside it could be you know very open or well, you could do very dense pores and then and have your open open pore go out here near the surface where it would carry away the heat from the magnets. So and then just blow it through. Well, you just blow it through like a stack and then you recollect it and recompress it, re regasify it, and then throw it back through the core again to keep this the centerpiece. Uh. Not only that, you know, when you talk about using gases like that to cool off a, a ton of magnets or tons of magnets like that, you could use what Boeing uses for a lot of their stuff, which is air bearings. So you could float that thing on a giant air bearing and just have like the the magnetic bearing be like a like a secondary thing, but under pressure, you could technically use some type of gaseous uh, bearing. Although you've got enough magnets here, and you're probably going to have enough money anyways, so you might as well use big giant, you know, convex and concave uh, magnets or magnet assemblies because you can you can do it uh, with a bunch of magnets, and then then you'd uh, you'd have a, a little bit more stability. Either way, uh, MITT magnetic. Internally tunable tokamak. So that's uh, that's what I'm I'm preaching here. I think that the the ripple outer core, the ripple inner core, the spun core on the inside, and you know if we did do some type of gaseous thing where we where we pump like a really cold gas through there to cool off this core and keep it cold, uh, you know that that's got some benefits too because you could use well you could put you could mount a big turbine blade on the inside here and have it attached to various points and make it so when the gas goes through it spins it up via you know just having a big ass turbine mount on the inside so you know I mean let's we can go ahead and just kind of draw that in there if we want to you know I mean honestly for something like this it's pretty cool you know I can have that go through there the gas to go through there you have like turbine blades that would, I think that'd be kind of cool This is just a kind of cutaway view here. Get the turbine blades in there. And then you could really spin that thing up. Then it would be crazy fast, that thing in there getting spun up. Does it have to be crowd junkie cool? Well, you could have just a, you could have a air to, air-to-liquid heat exchangers with a separate cryogenic system. There, there's a couple ways to do it. I think, do you need cryogenics? Uh, I'm, I'm not even sure if you need those. I, I think uh, with this type of agitation, do you need cryogenics? Mm. We'd, have, we'd have to look at it. I, I think uh, if you're beaten on that with a... Uh, oh, you can, you can get... Millions of times stronger than the natural magnet, so yeah, you're, you're probably going to need to energize that somehow. Well, you can make it self-powering. You can put a turbine in it, so as the gases go through, they they spin it up and power the magnets and carry away the gas. So this this could be a self-contained thing where you don't have any power lines going through here, unless you wanted to collect the power somehow with commutators. You know, well, I mean, let's see, going through there. Well, you could create a giant PN junction or these could be pickup coils too to pick up. Well, you have, there's a number of ways to do it. I mean, this is a different design, so I'll think about this some more. The, putting the turbine in there is one thing. Getting it spun up is another. I mean, we've already got these nice linear accelerators here, so let's let's just take that thing out of there. I don't really, I guess we don't really need it. But like I was saying, you could you could make this self-contained, where you have. Uh, smaller turbine I guess up in here and as the gases go through I guess it would power that and it would power the ring so the faster you spun it the more power it would have and this would make it so you wouldn't have have to use commutators but and it's just an idea
pretty cool. We're just getting more and more advanced as we go. And you know, let's just keep going until until it makes its uh, makes its presence known here on Earth because it still looks pretty cool when we got this thing drawn out when I've got it drawn out in my head it's there's so many different things you can do with this because you have this reloadable focused fusion point and before we didn't have a reloadable focus fusion point we had to pump stuff in there and charge everything up and then do a shot and hope it lasts and it's gonna be the same thing with uh, the, the big spherical fusion reactor the difference I think is the spherical one and this one is this one could be much smaller than that one and it could probably be lighter weight and portable and I'm thinking like Navy applications that would be cool you know put a fusion reactor on a Navy vessel it probably could do something like this and uh, of course if this thing is spun fast enough then you'd have gyroscopic stabilization which might be helpful for several different types of uh, Navy or ocean going vessels either way uh, that's where we're at right here and, and I did this just kind of a equation to to try to think about what's going on and how many different types of pressures and and what types of variables we have and, and what could it what could it approach down here in the trench if if we could have if we could have maybe a hundred 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 fifty well, say say hundred million C here and that could just grow up go up with gradient uh, pressure there so you know let's say 100 150 175 so it, between four and five, two hundred, and then to two twenty-five, two fifty, maybe two fifty, and that's uh, millions degree, million degrees C, million degrees C. Then max pressure, you know, down here in the very, very bottom, could we go and make that leap from two hundred fifty million degrees C up to uh, one billion C? Well, you could see something like that, especially when you, you're, stu you're talking about uh, that type of pressure. Or, uh, I don't know, maybe 250. Let's let's just say let's just say 500. It's, it could it could double. And the problem though is this gradient from here at at five to to the peak to the very point down here in the very very tiny part. I don't want to make a whole bunch of fusible product. I just want to make a repeat, a repeating shot that can go off, ding, 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 and be reloadable. That's one of the problems is getting the chamber reloaded so you can have another shot. And let's just say max pressure is at somewhere near uh, 500 degrees, let's see, 500 million, and that should be uh, more than enough. We'll be we'll be way over what we need fusion and I think the flux lines per linear nanometer down in that cup down there is going to be high enough as well you know because as this pushes in and that pushes in it's well if we push too hard I'm relying how am I getting these temperatures I'm relying on the atoms themselves when I looked at the fields the valence shells of the atoms themselves and how, how Hard, they're gonna push back at each other I saw that just before fusion they would spin up and they just they'd go crazy because it's almost like you're trying to crush them it's like like a, like a bug and you're stepping on it and it's like eh! and that's, that's essentially what the atoms do way down here is they all start they go into like this hyper mode as, as the pressures go up they don't they don't go slower they go even faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and they throw off lots of heat and that's that's where you get that, that spike. I I thought it could go higher. The the pressures between atoms is gonna go really 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 high. Um, yeah, from from what I can visualize down inside this little pocket, they're just they're it creates a, like a, a different type of like soup. It's like a like an atomic soup down there as this as the as the V gets crushed. So uh, visualize, come on, visualize with me. Look at all this cool stuff. And, and I brought the camera a little bit closer so maybe you can see this stuff a little bit better and kind of put you at an angle so you can see like a little bit more of what's going on here. Let me step back for just a minute and just look at all this this stuff here. It's, it's just, you got this, 
got a reactor right here. That's that's like there's so much going on, and I'm gonna leave this on my board for a while so I can think about it. And this is this has all been in my head, just bouncing around for for like a month now, and I'm like pretty convinced at this point that what I what I saw today with this this pressure trough and seeing what the atoms do down that pressure trough. You know, the valence shells, when you talk about metallic hydrogen versus just standard atomic valence shells, essentially what we're wanting to do is get in the range converting hydrogen into its metallic state. So if you want to know the truth of what this does, just before fusion is you have to essentially make it superconductive. You have to make the hydrogen superconductive. And that's, I, I've been preaching metallic hydrogen physics for a, a while, but essentially you have to take the hydrogens in there and get it under enough pressure. It's not just temperature. Temperature makes the atoms wiggle. Uh, you have to have the pressure to convert it into a metallic state. Now, metallic hydrogen is supposedly stable up to, what is it? like? Or it's, it's found in places where it's like 57, hundred degrees Kelvin which is really hot and we could very well be seeing that phase shift and once the hydrogen shifts into a and then we know the pressures of that okay that's that's kind of cool too we know it's like you know was it 420 gigapascals so that's that's essentially the pressures that we're gonna have down in there when we do achieve uh, a phase state change from normal hydrogen to its metallic state and even it's a liquid form that's essentially what we're doing is we're creating teeny tiny strings of metallic hydrogen and firing them off down in that down in that crevasse uh, will will that eventually be what we're seeing is, is that what the NIF is that what the National Ignition Facility has been doing all this time as they've been creating metallic hydrogen inside their a halodrum target that that target you know as, as it brings that down there's if there's hydrogen in there and they're crushing it down at some point they're going to phase shift the hydrogen in there into a metallic state and when that happens then the whole system goes superconductive and now the charge can well can move anywhere inside that string so uh, what do you do with metallic hydrogen at that point well if we are indeed creating metallic hydrogen in there, that could very well explain why we're seeing the, the fusion, at least in, that's why I'm seeing it in my, in my simulations in my own mind. Uh, are we going to achieve fusion with this? I think so, I think so. I think this is a, a good path to get to, the, to the, the pressures we need, the temperatures we need, everything. It looks like it's pointing towards now, is 500 million degrees C way hotter? Oh well, yeah, it's way hotter, but you know, at least we have an, a direction when it comes to some of our research with the diamond anvils, when we see that, you know, the, the gigapascals range that we need is uh, it's gonna be similar to what we're seeing in here. So now we have some, some pressure gradients and we know how to structure our materials and how thick to make our magnets and how, how, how can we support that little ribbon of, of forming metallic hydrogen. It's like a little little metallic hydrogen snake shooting out of there, a little rocket. And then it's lighting and blasting off, probably lighting and blasting off. So what do we do with that metallic hydrogen? Well, if, if we've got a system to create metallic hydrogen, now we've got to figure out some way to tap it and store it. That'd be really cool. Uh, but yeah, you should be able to uh, should be able to achieve your hydrogen uh, compression needed for fusion. And of course, the, uh, the back pressure from the near fusion and fusion events will boost that temperature up even higher. Go from 200, 250 to 500 million. And that's going to be a little bit better than this one. I mean, just because we get that reloadable, reloadable pocket there. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. This is like part three of this series. However, uh, part one and part two, you know, I may or may not keep those up. Let, let me look at those and, and see what the problem that the the other guy was having with some of my information on those. I thought I was pretty concise with that. Uh, obviously, somebody didn't like it. Let me let me find out what they what they were 
what they were griping about. And uh, in the meantime, though, enjoy this one. This is a little bit more complete. You got your linear accelerators, you got magnetic float, you've got a, a possible cooling system and, and self contained power system to be able to run these uh, the agitator magnets. Uh, we got a little bit more definition as to why we get such high pressures and temperatures. We got one hyperbola, we got two hyperbola, we got the crushing depths of the marinara trench of, uh, of fusion reactors there. That's the, the miniature marinara there. And, you know, I mean, wow, it's just, there's so much going on here. Uh, we may, have, like I said here, on, it may have to spin that core. Uh, it definitely reloads it, whether you agitate it or whether you spin it. It's just what your, your goal is, is to reload these pockets and crush them and cause the, uh, the fusion. Know what I mean? It's going to be exciting. We're going to have fusion. I'm excited. You should be excited, too. Anyways, i got to send this off to a few people. Uh, once again, this is the magnetic, internally tunable tokamak. And, of course, the internally tunable comes from the agitator and the matching pockets. That you know, And does it need to match? Well, you know, it, it might. It, is it going to work better to just use a, a slightly rippled core to where we have, like, like multiple ripples that are that are moving and, and then this outer one you probably the outer one needs to stay the same i think the outer one is correct uh, the inner one may need to change it may may need to uh to be more or maybe it just needs to be the same and just spun really really fast well we'll, we'll think on this for a while and uh thank you for joining me today